morning. I am John Gurton. I'm the creative arts pastor here. And I just received a text from our pastor saying I can take as long as I want. So we're going to be here about another hour. So just buckle in. Just kidding. Um, but I am not going to rush through this. This is an important thing for us to be hearing today. It's simple, but it is important. So um, I do have a question for you as we start. Do you ever catch yourself with the sneaking suspicion that you'll wake up on your deathbed with this nagging sense that somehow in all the hurry and busyness and frenetic activity, you missed the most important things. I see a hand over there. And I think if you haven't thought of that, you just did, right? It's one of those questions where you're like, oh man, that is a heavy, heavy question But this is a question that John Mark Comer asks in this book that we've been going through, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. We're on week two in this series based on this book. If you haven't done so already, I just want to encourage you to buy this book. You can't miss the cover, but it's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and it is an awesome book. We also have this companion guide. Physical copies are available in the cafe. We also have digital copies on our website and our app as well for you to follow along with throughout the week. But the reality of life is we live in a life of hurry. To be honest, I feel hurried right now uh, because service has gone a little bit longer. So I'm kind of like, all right, I got to play this. Like, do I go faster? Do I go slower? Do I take my time? I feel hurried. And I think that we can relate to that. We all have those moments where we live like that. But God didn't intend for us to live life in a rush just to go through everything every day so quickly. And I know it's easy for me to stand up here and say, stop hurrying. And I could just sit down, right? I could just say, unhurry. Don't do it anymore. But there's more to it than that. It's an impossible practice to achieve in our minds. What with the housework, kids' activities, work, work, lawn care, church, serving in the church, the plethora of TV shows we have to watch in order to stay current on the current saga that everyone is talking about so you don't miss out, we don't have time, right? Because of all of those things. But Paul, who was a follower of Jesus, who had some crazy transformations in this life that he lived, he says this in Ephesians. He says, be very careful then how you live. Be very careful. Make it intentional how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. And I think while reading that, some of you had anxiety. Because you're thinking, that is why I'm hurrying, so that I can make the most of every opportunity. I need to get all of this done in order to focus my attention on this opportunity to make the most out of that. And it causes us to feel this need to get things done in order to have time to get other things done that matter more. But really, the question here is, are we being wise or unwise with the time that we do have? How are we utilizing our time? I want to tell you a quick story before we head into the rest of the message. A few weeks ago, someone here in the church gifted Angela and I a trip up to Boyne, and it was around Father's Day weekend, so we decided to invite my parents and my in-laws up there, and um, they came up on Thursday night. Now, my parents came up a little bit later, and it's a long drive. They didn't get up there until about 11.30 at night, so it was super dark, and they were tired. Um, But instead of going to sleep, we stayed up and we talked for a little while about their day, how things are going, how the trip was. So we didn't get to bed till super late. Well, the next morning, my kids decided to get up at 7 a.m. like they always do, regardless of when they go to bed, because they're kids and they're hungry and they've got that trigger. So they got up at 7. So I woke up with them and I went to take them out into the living room for breakfast. And as I turned into the living room, I see my dad sitting on the couch with his Bible open and he's praying. And I looked at him, and I said, what is wrong with you? And he looked back at me, and he was like, what? And I was like, why are you not sleeping? And he was just like puzzled, like, why would you ask that question? Because my dad, who's the founding pastor here at FBC, Pastor Gurton, has lived a life committing himself to spiritual disciplines. He understands the importance of what these disciplines, or as John Mark Comer calls them, these practices of Jesus can do, how they impact your life. And he's made a commitment, even though he was up super late, I'm going to be spending my time with God. I know that when I say words like spiritual disciplines or practices of Jesus, for those of you that have been in the church for a while, your eyes might start to glaze over because you've like, oh, I've heard this before. I've I've heard this so many times. I know, I get it. 
And I could have just come up here and been like, you need to pray more and you need to spend time with God. Amen? Amen. We know it. We get it, right? But do we practice it is the question. That's the hard part, the implementation of it. John Ortberg says, practices such as reading scripture and praying are important, not because they prove how spiritual we are, but because God can use them to lead us into life. And a lot of the times we have the wrong motivation behind these practices because we want to do it because we're a Christian. I have to do these things. I'm supposed to do these things. We even might feel some guilt instead of that overflow of I get to be with God. I have the opportunity to spend time with him. We view it in a different lens. But I do remember a a great speaker, um, inspiring person. He was an NBA player named Allen Iverson. Um, And he talked, I'm just joking about those prerequisites, but he talked about uh, his idea of what practice was a a number of years ago. So let's check out this quick clip. We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? Man, we're talking about practice. I know I'm supposed to be there. I know I'm supposed to lead by example. I know that. And I'm not, I'm not shoving it aside, you know, like it don't mean anything. I know it's important. I do. I honestly do. But we're talking about practice, man. What are we talking about? practice. I love that within that clip, he's like, I get it. I know. I'm not shoving it aside. And then he literally shoves it aside and says, but we're talking about practice. But as I watched that, and as I started to think about that clip, I was like, man, how often do we do that with these practices of Jesus? I know I'm supposed to do this. I know I'm supposed to practice these things. I know I'm supposed to lead by example, but are they really that important? Do they really matter that much? Is it really going to impact my life? that much? Is it really that big of a deal? But what happens when we practice is we get better at something. When we practice, we build upon a foundation that we're creating. And this is true of any sport and of any hobby. And that's why in the scriptures, they refer to sports a lot. They say, run the race so that you can have endurance and perseverance to give you this picture that it's not just, I can't wake up tomorrow and say, I'm going to run a 5K. I don't run. I don't like to run. I don't see the point in running. Why would you run unless you're running away from something? That's my mentality. So if I wake up tomorrow and I'm like, going to run a 5K, but I've never had practice, I'm not going to succeed. I'm going to cramp up. I'm going to keel over after about a quarter mile. So that, that's the thing, though, is if I was to practice it, and condition myself and get to that point where I know I can run the 5K, I have that confidence to step out and do those things. So these practices are vital. Eugene Peterson has a unique thought on this whole thing, though. He says, The Jesus way, wedded to the Jesus truth, brings about the Jesus life. And that, that's a great phrase right there. We could write that down and put it on our wall. We could put it as a background on our phone and just remember that and be like, yeah, that's, that's a great thought. But then he says this, but Jesus as the truth gets far more attention than Jesus as the way. Jesus as the way is the most frequently evaded metaphor among the Christians with whom I have worked for for 50 years as a North American pastor. See, what we've done is we've settled in on resting on the Jesus truth and say that's good enough. Well, Jesus' truth is true, and that is something we need to pursue, and that is an amazing thing. He is the truth, but he is also the way and the life. So while the truths of Jesus are essential, he doesn't call us just to know his truths, to hear them, but he calls us to implement them, to live them out. That's why we're told again and again in scriptures to live like Jesus. 1 John 2.6 says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, this is a, a big word, is a liar. That's a heavy word. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did, must follow his way. Whoever claims the truths of Jesus should live in the life and the way of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.21 simply says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. You should follow his way. 
Ephesians 5, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. John Mark Comer says this, if you want to experience the life to the full of Jesus, his nonstop conscious enjoyment of God's presence in the world, all you have to do is adopt not only his theology and ethics, his truth, but also his lifestyle. Just follow his way. As I said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That word way in this original passage is translated from the word hodos, which literally means his way is a lifestyle that we are called to follow because it means a road, journey, or path. We are literally walking in the path, the journey of Jesus as Christians. It goes beyond just words about who and what we say we are, and it needs to transition to a transformation of everything we are. John Mark Homer again says, the hard truth is that following Jesus is something you do. It is a practice as much as a faith. At their core, the practices of Jesus are about a relationship with the God he called Father, and all relationships take time. So it begs the question again, are we being wise or unwise with our time? So this morning, we're going to go ahead and focus on the first practices of Jesus that will hopefully allow us to unhurry. And they are silence and solitude. So let's first focus on the idea of silence. You uncomfortable yet? It's funny, in the first service I did that, and some people were like, no, that was great. It's like the first moment of silence they've had that morning. But the thing is, in our world, silence makes us uncomfortable, if we're honest about it. I am very guilty of this. I usually fill silence with a humorous comment. I deflect silence as much as possible. I'll fill silence up by picking up my phone and mindlessly scrolling through it because I don't want to have to face the painful reality of silence. I do not like it. It makes me uncomfortable. John Mark Homer makes this point, though. He says, The noise of the modern world makes us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the one input we most need. So if we need silence so much, why do we avoid it? Well, let's take a look at two dimensions of silence. The first one being external, the second one being internal. So what's external silence? It's very simple. You put things on mute. You turn off the TV, no music, no ringtones letting us know that we shouldn't be silent because there's something else more important right now than silence. St. John Climacus said, the friend of silence draws near to God. So muting everything so that you can draw near to God. But why is it that we have this need for noise all the time? I mean, think about it, really. We wake up in the morning, and most of us will turn on some music. We'll grab our phones to watch a YouTube video. We'll get in the car and turn on some music. We are to the point where we need sound and noise so much that we will have sound machines to sleep. I mean, think about how weird that is, that we need noise to sleep, to rest. We're surrounded by noise, and it's no surprise that we feel like we're in a hurry all the time because this noise is drawing our attention, and we might not want that noise, so we're drawn to another noise. And then this noise is drawing us over here, and then this noise is drawing us over here. So we're constantly moving from noise to noise. It's kind of like scanning your car radio. For those of you that still listen to the radio, you can go into your car, you hit the scan button, it goes from station to station. So for me, if I do that in my car, it lands on a country station, and I skip it right away, because I don't want that kind of noise in my life. It's not something that I appreciate, all right? (laughs) So then, yeah, all right, all right. Some of you, it's okay, whatever, you can like country music. But then it'll go to oldies music, and I'm going to sit on that, because I love oldies music. It is music that I will listen to all the time. And then it'll scan to the next station, and it's classical music. And I just laugh, and I'm like, why is this a station? Does anybody actually listen to this? But I... (laughs) Bill does. He loves it. But this is like a symptom of our lives. We hit this scan button every morning. 
If I'm not hearing noise on the radio, then I want to be on my phone to hear this noise. And if I'm not hearing noise on my phone, then I need to go have a conversation with somebody. If I'm not having a conversation, then I need to turn on some TV. If I'm not watching TV, then I need to get on my computer so that I can see what's happening on social media. You see what I'm getting at, at here? We are surrounded by noise. This external noise distracts us. And John Mark Homer poses this question. Could it be that we're using external noise to drown out internal noise? So here's the thing. Internal noise. What is that? It's the mental chatter that never stops. It's our own personal commentary. Those moments that we replay because they were so cringeworthy. Why did I say that? What happened there? I don't even remember doing that, but I did it. Now I don't know. And you replay it over and over again. I should have said this. Those inappropriate thoughts about a coworker or friend. Those grass is greener thoughts that we have. See, we choose external noise because we don't want to face the internal noise of life. We're escaping this internal noise because we know that it's in the silence that God is going to speak to us and reveal to us things that we don't really want to deal with. Because as soon as we have those moments where God's like, hey, I want you to know that I love you and here's something you can work on. Uh, I don't want to face that. I don't want to deal with that. But as we've read in the scripture, Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. First, be still, be silent, then know that I am God. Lamentations 3.26, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Exodus 14.14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. All you have to do is shut up. Just be silent. I'm here for you is what he's saying. I want you to think about that passage for a second. When we stop, when we are silent, what we're saying is, I'm no longer in control. I'm not trying to talk my way around this. I'm not trying to figure it out. I'm giving it to God, and he's going to fight for me. There is submission in the silence. Isaiah 30, 15, For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. See, in the silence, God speaks to us. But I know that you're surrounded by noise. We've got all these things going on. So the next part of this is so pivotal. Solitude. Solitude. Sometimes we just have to get away from it all. I know it's not possible. We think that. We've got the demands of home, work, family, and more to deal with. So finding solitude, that seems like ridiculous. But Henry Nouwen says, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside time to be with God and listen to him. Now keep in mind, when I say solitude, I don't mean isolation. There's a, a big difference here. I was just talking to Randy a couple weeks ago about this show that I've been watching called Alone. And literally in this show, they will take people and drop them off on an island or someplace in the wilderness, give them like 10 items that they have and a phone if you need to tap out. And then they say, peace out try and survive, and they have a camera where they'll film themselves. Now, nine times out of ten, whether they've made it seven days or the last season we watched was 87 days, it messes with their mind, the isolation. They get to the point where they are just desperate for people. They treat their camera like it's their best friend, like Wilson on Castaway. They get to this point where they are just, I need people, and isolation messes with them. But also nine times out of ten, when they come out the other side and they finally do leave, they say things like this. Man, I know myself better than I ever did before. I saw God in such a way that I've never seen him before. I have grown so much in this experience. So isolation dwells in loneliness. But solitude helps you grow. Solitude helps you reflect. Much like Richard Foster says, loneliness is inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. Again, I know this is easier said than done. But we're called to live in the way of Jesus. And we see again and again Jesus in Mark 1 and Matthew 3. Right after he gets baptized, he goes into the wilderness and he's tempted. He, he makes sure that he has solitude. The word here for desert or wilderness is eremos, which means a solitary place. And John Mark Homer in the book, he talks about how he views this rather than a time of testing and trial and weakness for Jesus as a time of strength. Because what happens is after these 40 days, 
Jesus is now so well prepared, so now grounded in Christ and who he is in Christ that he goes out and he does his ministry. And he does it in power and in strength. But he knew he needed that time alone to be filled in order to do this. Jesus recognized the need for it and he led by example. He goes back to this place of Aramos over and over again. In Mark 6, it talks about how there were people who were coming and going. They didn't even have a chance to eat the disciples and Jesus. They were hungry. And so they said, hey, let's go off to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to an Aramos. Now in this story, what's amazing is they went away, they got filled, and then Jesus turns around and he feeds 5,000. He does a miracle. He breaks the loaves and the two fish and he feeds all of these people because he was able to be filled in order to fill others. You know, in the book of Luke alone, Jesus went to Eremos, the solitary place, nine times. Luke 5.15 says, Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So regardless of what you might think, when you say, yeah, but Jesus had a lot more time than I did. You don't understand the pressures that I'm under, the things that happen. Jesus understood. So much so that he literally had crowds of people clamoring to be around him, to heal, to, to talk to, to just touch his garment, to just to be around him, to the point where he couldn't eat, that he didn't have time for himself. And so he said, I'm going to take time. So if Jesus took the time to withdraw, why don't we? Well, we've got these excuses. I don't have enough time. There's too much to do. When I do have time, I get interrupted. I'm just so tired that when I finally have time, I just want to sleep. Or we just disregard it and say, I'm fine. I don't need that. I don't need solitude and silence. John Mark Comer again says this, though. Jesus needed time. You think you don't? I mean, honestly, if the Son of God needs time, who are we to say, well, I don't, I'm fine. See, if we could get beyond hearing and talking about the truths of God and start living in the way of God and the practices of Jesus, we would see the need to be in his presence so that we can continually be filled. Because it's in the silence where we hear God and it is in the solitude where we begin to be filled by God. So what can we do? Be intentional. It's as simple as that, but as hard as that. This past week, I set my alarm 30 minutes earlier than I normally do to get up in the morning. 30 minutes. It doesn't impact your beauty sleep that much. See? (laughs) I know, it's bad. Uh, But 30 minutes does not impact you that much. In fact, getting up 30 minutes early to go sit in my favorite chair, to read some scripture and be still, caused me to shape my day. It caused me to have time for God to say, this is what I want you to do instead of the plans that you had. So this week, set your alarm 15 to 30 minutes earlier and label it on your phone. If you've got a phone and you set your alarms, just label it silence and solitude. And spend 15 to 30 minutes in quiet and solitude. Find your Aramos too. Okay, so don't just do that without thinking about it. Find a place of solitude. Don't spend that time in a place of distraction. I'm not going to do that in my office. I'm going to do it somewhere where I don't have distraction. Don't spend that time in bed because you're going to fall back asleep. Get up and move around and find a place where you can be. And you might be saying, mornings don't work for me. My schedule, that's, that's not going to work. Well, don't make an excuse. Look at your day. Maybe it's on a lunch break. Maybe you take your lunch to work or you go get lunch. Stay in your car. Turn off your radio. Turn off your phone. Eat lunch there. Spend some time with Jesus. Be present. Listen to his voice. Maybe it's on your drive to work. Maybe you have a commute. Instead of listening to NPR or listening to the radio or classical music, Bill, you could just turn it off and listen and be with God. Maybe it's while you're feeding your baby in the nursery. And instead of scrolling on your phone, you could be listening to God. Maybe it's on an extended bathroom break. I know that's weird, but it could work. (laughs) Maybe it's before you go to bed. Not in bed, but before you go to bed. Or you could replace the time you spend on Netflix with God. So instead of, for me, watching a show about other people being alone, maybe I could go be alone, you know? (laughs) Replace the time you spend scrolling on your newsfeed. How many hours 
do we sit here on Instagram and Facebook and our news and ESPN and all these different things? Andrew Sullivan puts it this way, if the churches came to understand that the greatest threat to faith today is not hedonism but distraction, perhaps they might begin to appeal anew to a frazzled digital generation. So if we want people to know and see who Jesus really is, then we need to practice his way and spend time in his presence so we may be filled to overflowing with him. So I know we're running over a little bit, but I want to give you an opportunity this morning to be in silence, to to not think about everything else going on. Angela's going to sing a song. Be silent. If you know the song, don't sing along with it. Don't talk to your neighbor about how beautiful Angela's voice is. It is. Don't get on your phone. Even if you're like, well, I'm going to film Angela singing this so I can post it later. Don't get on your phone and say, I want to look up what song this is on my phone. Put it down. Put it away. Be silent. Be silent. Be quiet. And be present in this moment. Maybe you need to close your eyes. Just listen to the words of this song. So as we close this morning, I just want you to simply commit to trying silence and solitude this week. Intentionally. Don't just say you're going to and be like, Pastor John said I'm going to, so I'm going to. Actually commit to it. For one week, one week, set an alarm. Have a reminder somewhere. Find your Eremos, your solitary place, and spend time with God in silence. It's one week. You can do this for one week. And after a week, see what kind of difference it makes for 15 to 30 minutes every day out of your week. 
Again, you can do that. You can find 15 to 30 minutes. See if it impacts how hurried you feel. The last page of this chapter in the book, I'm going to close by reading that and then praying. And it says this. Here's to tomorrow morning. Six o'clock. Coffee. The chair by the window. The window by the tree. Time to breathe. A psalm and a story from the Gospels. Hearing the Father's voice pouring out my own. Or just sitting, resting. Maybe I'll hear a word from God that will alter my destiny. Maybe I'll just process my anger over something that's bothering me. Maybe I'll feel my mind settle like untouched water. Maybe my mind will ricochet from thought to thought and never come to rest. If so, that's fine. I'll be back. Same time tomorrow, starting my day in the quiet place. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this is such a simple, simple thing. And yet, God, we so often neglect it. God, I thank you for the opportunity we had just a few minutes ago just to spend time in your presence, to not think about everything else to be quiet. God, I ask that you would remind us of that this week. If if we don't set an alarm, if we don't write it down, that your presence would prompt us to be still, to find a place to be in your presence, to know you more, to be filled by you, to hear your voice. God, I know it's going to happen, that we're going to leave this place and immediately the the noise of this world is going to surround us. But God, help us to intentionally pursue you in the silence to grow deeper in our relationship with you, to follow your way. God, we give this all to you and we commit it to you and we ask that, again, you would give us the strength, the endurance to do these things, to practice the life of Jesus. We love you and praise you. Amen.